Welcome everyone to the Capacity Building Session 2, the JIAS Scientific Writing Workshop. Today, I'm Associate Professor Twitya Sujarilak. Together with Professor Kenneth Mayer, we host this session together. And first of all, I would like to introduce my first speaker, Professor Kenneth Mayer. Professor Kenneth Mayer is currently a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and a professor in global health and population at the Harvard T.C. Chan School of Public Health and attending physician and director of HIV prevention research at Beth Israel De Kones Hospital. Dr. Mayer has co-authored for more than 800 peer-reviewed publications, co-authored the first text on AIDS for general public, and has co-audited about five academic texts, and currently an editor-in-chief of the Journal of International AIDS Society. And today he will give a talk about how to write and submit the research manuscript to the journal. Dr. Kenneth Mayer, please. Thank you, Dr. Tatibia. I'm Kenneth Mayer from Fenway Health and Harvard Medical School and School of Public Health in Boston, Massachusetts, in the United States. I'm going to be um, presenting in the scientific writing workshop on how to write and submit a research manuscript. Um, this is um, also refers to my affiliation as one of the editors in chief of the Journal of the International AIDS Society. My conflicts of interest are unrestricted research grants from Gilead Sciences and Merck. I just want to mention the International um, Aid Society's journal, uh, which I co-edit. Uh, we are online, peer-reviewed, open access, and we have a very good impact factor. So we certainly are eager uh, for your manuscripts, which is certainly one of my intents in presenting to you today. Uh, so in terms of the talk, um, I'm going to be talking in general about how to write a research manuscript, how you can submit, editorial decision making and reasons for rejection, and responding to reviewers. And I'll answer some of your questions. And that, then Dr. Chatibia will be talking more from the standpoint of somebody who is submitting uh, papers to journals. Uh, so from a scientific point of view, if results are not published, it means the research did not take place. Uh, and research can be defined very broadly. It can be quantitative, which could be experiments or cohort studies or surveys. It can be qualitative, interviews, ethnography, media analyses, content analyses, or mixed methods. But the important thing is to write up the results and to get them uh, published. Uh, so in terms of writing a research manuscript, it's all about the question. So the question helps you decide how do you design and implement the research. Um, it also informs how you analyze the data, how you discuss the findings, and then does it raise other questions. So this is really uh, the process for the research. When we think about the structure of papers, it's really important to try to adhere to the conventions. Uh, there is generally a title page, uh, an abstract, an introduction, methods and materials, results. Uh, tables and figures are not absolutely necessary in all papers, but usually come uh, up with many papers. And then discussion is important and references are important as well. So how do you start writing a paper? First of all, you have to order your thoughts. You have to make it clear what's the motivation of the study. Is it something new and interesting? Uh, did it resolve certain problems? Um, how did it address these problems? And then you want to go through the, uh, the key conventions of the methods first, the results, uh, uh, and the dis discussion. Uh, introduction, uh, this is uh, out of order in the, the sequence, uh, but introduction is extremely important as well. Uh, so let's talk about the abstract. The abstract is the part most often read, and sometimes it's the only part that people will read before deciding whether they want to read a whole paper or not, and, and that's often the case with reviewers. So you want it to be short, specific, informative, and representative. Um, and this is your advertisement. So let's take an example. Is this a good title? Integrated Delivery of Antiretroviral Treatment and Pre-Exposure Prophylaxis to HIV the one infected, zero to score in couples in East Africa, 
a qualitative evaluation study in Uganda. So the reason this is a good title is that it answers the what you can see in blue, it answers the who uh, in purple, it answers the where in red, and the how in brown. And it, it combines all these features, so it really tells the reader what they're going to expect. Uh, so some of the problems that editors encounter if the abstract is inconsistent or incomplete. Uh, so uh, that will make editors very uh, irate. Uh, it's really important that the abstract um, gives a background, gives some sense of the experimental design, the major findings and the conclusion. And the abstract needs to stand alone. And it's important that you don't um, present data or numbers in the abstract that are not consistent in the main paper. Uh, the introduction. What was your question? Uh, that's the most important thing. Um, you know, what's the topic? What's the context? You know, has previous research been done? Uh, the challenge. Uh, um, why is this uh, an important knowledge gap that this paper is going to address? And what is the key aim of the study? And the biggest problem we encounter in introductions is that the, the rationale for the study is not made clear, and that can be a real um, problem. Uh, for reviewers and editors. Think of it as a funnel shaped um, kind of process. You want to start from the general, what's the general problem? Um, HIV is spreading throughout the world and you want to end up with the specific, uh, we did the study to address the following issue to help um, um, address the spread of HIV, for example. In the materials and methods, uh, how did you do the study? So the materials and methods are important. They validate the study. And it's very useful to use subheadings uh, because oftentimes you're using uh, um, different categories of topics that you're addressing in the materials and methods. You want it to be detailed enough to allow for replication. So you want to talk about procedures, materials used, data collected, uh, sort of how, how you did the analyses. Uh, better to do this all in the past tense and make sure you don't um, have results embedded in uh, the materials and methods. Uh, the results are in the results section. And so this is one way of thinking about the methods. Uh, you can talk about who was the subject of the study. We recruited X thousand patients uh, from the following uh, category. Uh, how, how was the study designed? What, um, you know, what data were collected? And this will tell the reader whether this is a quantitative study, a qualitative study, um, and will also give the reader some sense of the analytic approaches. Uh, you want the reader to know where the study uh, took place and what was measured over time, uh, what were the key um, factors of interest, and when did it take place? Um, this is very important. Um, you oftentimes, if, if this is a study that you are building on previous studies, you can reference methods from other uh, papers to save on the word count, because you certainly don't want to uh, use too many words. But you want at the end of the materials and methods for the reader to have a good sense of um, these key elements before they plunge into reading uh, the results. In the results, uh, what findings did your study question generate? Uh, so you want to think about how do you best present your data? Uh, you want to avoid repetition uh, when you present data. So you might refer to a figure, but don't um, um, say everything that's on the figure in, in the um, written text, the figure should be able to speak for itself, but you certainly want to highlight uh, key findings from the results. You want to be very concrete. Uh, generally, you want to use the past tense because the research has now uh, been completed. You want to follow um, um, the syntax in the logical way so that the reader can understand the flow of how the study was uh, conducted. And if you use the word significant, it should meet a statistical test of significance. Otherwise, uh, that's really um, false advertising. And you want to present results relevant to your study question. So if you have an interesting finding, but you haven't in the uh, introduction or the methods uh, referenced it, uh, you may get the reviewers uh, scratching their heads. Um, so you want to relate the results to the methods, but don't repeat the methods. Uh, you've already told the reader about the methods and wait for the discussion. Don't contextualize the results. They should 
um, speak for themselves. And then in the discussion, you can compare and contrast uh, to other studies. In terms of figures and tables, um, you, you want to make sure that they stand on their own. You want to uh, present them in a visually appealing way. You want to have informative titles and label everything so that the reader can understand what you're doing. And you want to um, be careful with colors because some reviewers may be colorblind. Uh, some journals are only black and white um, uh, printing. So uh, oftentimes it's just easier to do this in black and white. So I want to mention two examples of figures. So the, the type of figure you use will depend on uh, what your message is. If you want to show trends in data over time, a linear depiction is very helpful. On the other hand, if you want to do comparisons within um, um, categories, it's much more helpful than to use um, bars, um, in this case, where you're trying to show a uh, continuum of care. Uh, this is a much more visually appealing way of showing the data. Then in the discussion, you want to order your thoughts. Um, did the results answer your question? Um, and if they didn't, why not? Uh, how do the results compare to studies in other countries and populations? What were the specific challenges? Could your findings be replicated elsewhere? And what are the implications of your findings for policy, practice, and research? Um, don't repeat the results. Uh, make sure you use key references so that the study is contextualized. Uh, one turnoff for reviewers is if they've worked in the same area and their paper is not cited and it was an important paper, that's a big omission. So you want to make sure that you use the discussion to contextualize and, and make sure that the reader knows how the research you've generated fits in with the overall field of research. You want to mention the limitations of the paper. Um, not all studies can do everything for all populations. So you want to say um, either there were limitations of the study design or limited population or challenges uh, because of a circumstance. Um, and you want to make sure that all things in the discussion are supported by the data in the manuscript. The conclusion is very important. This is your take home messages. It's an opportunity to talk about the wider implications of your findings. And you can use this to offer recommendations you know, and don't use obvious statements, repetition of results, or overgeneralizations. Uh, references uh, may be the place that we see the most errors um, in publications. You want credibility. You want to make sure that um, you show that you know the field. You want to use the reference to validate your claims and arguments. Don't keep only citing yourself. That's called citation bias. Um, and format your references according to the journal's guidelines. And, that's important. And make sure you read um, um, the sources so that um, you know um, how your paper fits in with other um, research. Uh, there are other sections uh, in papers. You want to make sure that the acknowledgments um, um, recognize the funding source. You want to make sure that you comply with your funder's regulations. Uh, different organizations uh, have requirements. You also want to mention the author's contributions, who has done what and certainly lists conflicts of interest. So submitting a manuscript. Um, the first thing is to go to the journal's instructions. Each journal has different rules. Every journal has a web page. You also may want to look at a recent issue of a journal uh, to just look at how they're styled. There are uniform requirements and you can uh, go online to find these as well. But I find the most helpful thing is pay attention to what each journal um, what their editorial policy is. Um, keep in mind that there are some things that are ignored and you do this at your peril. Um, you may think that the paper really needs 5,000 words, but if that kind of paper um, for that specific journal, um, the limit is 3,500 words, don't exceed that number because the editors will be irate. Um, they're not gonna do the editing for you and um, they may feel that they really can't fully evaluate your paper because that's too much extra text. Um, you want to make sure that you use the right reference formats and you want to make sure how you insert tables and figures. Some journals want them inserted um, through the, out the text. Some want them completely separate. Uh, there are some, some journals have requirements for the kinds of files, JPEG or other kinds of files, so you have to keep that in mind. And another small thing is uh, abbreviations. Um, 
in the world of AIDS research, there are several kinds of um, topics that we abbreviate and we know very easily. Uh, for example, MSM, men who have sex with men. But the first time you use it, you should write it out in any journal. That's the convention. Um, cover letter is very important. This is an opportunity to tell the editor why the paper is important, why you chose that journal. Uh, so that's, that can be very helpful uh, when you submit that along with the paper. Uh, in terms of editorial decision making and common reasons for rejection, uh, this is an editorial process. Each journal will be a little bit different, but basically uh, when somebody submits online, uh, the senior editors of the journal usually uh, make an initial triage decision. They may immediately reject a paper because uh, they feel it just is not appropriate for the journal. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can't resubmit, uh, um, and very often these decisions are not necessarily uh, provided, providing additional information. Uh, but usually that's a sign with an early rejection that it's a good idea to go to another journal. Um, after the editors make initial triage decision, they'll send it out to expert reviewers, and um, at least two, oftentimes more. And those expert reviewers sometimes will accept a paper right away. That's um, um, less common than most scenarios. Usually they'll ask for revisions, and then it's back and forth with the author and the editorial office as to whether they are responsive to the revisions. Uh, when you submit a paper, um, the editor um, who's looking at the paper wants to think, does the paper fit in within the scope of the journal? Some papers are excellent, but they're not right for a specific journal. Another question is, is the objective of the study clear? Are the results important? Does the study contribute something novel? Uh, validity of the methodology is important. And um, is the presentation of the data good quality? Some papers just lose out because they're just done in such a um, sloppy way that the editors feel that it's not uh, easily salvageable. Um, some of the reasons for instant rejection that are very important to keep in mind, um, uh, if it's not within the journal scope, so really try to keep in mind what the journal's scope is. Um, don't just uh, um, submit the paper because uh, you think it's a prestigious journal. Um, if the type of uh, manuscript is not one that the journal publishes. So if it's a qualitative study and the journal never publishes qualitative studies, it's not worth submitting it there. If the instructions to authors are grossly ignored, that's not a uh, good idea. Um, you know, if there are clear methodologic weaknesses, that's a challenge. Uh, but the biggest red flag are ethical problems. If there's evidence of auto plagiarism, if uh, the paper is very similar to something else the author submitted, um, or if it seems like there's uh, uh, some ethical problem in the conduct of the study, paper will get rejected out of hand. Uh, if the hypotheses are not clear, or if the analysis is not um, correct, that will be a reason for um, instant rejection. And certainly if the paper looks like it's similar to other papers uh, and doesn't add anything new, it could be rejected right away. Here are some useful resources for you to um, attend to. Um, there are many uh, publications on um, ethics in um, paper writing. Uh, there are different consortia of editors that publish their criteria for submitting papers. Uh, but as I said earlier, uh, the most important thing when you submit a specific paper is to look at the instructions for authors of the specific journal. Um, that will stand you in the best stead um, in terms of opportunities to get your paper accepted for publication. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Thanks, Professor Kenneth Mayer for a very nice uh, talk. So let's move to the second talk of this session, which will be presented by me. For the brief introduction about myself, um, I'm uh, Associate Professor Twitya Sujirit Lak, currently a PhD Infectious Disease Specialist at the Chiang Mai University, and also the Head of the Clinical and Molecular Epidemiology of Emerging and Re-Emerging Infectious Disease Research Cluster at the Faculty of Medicine, Chiang Mai University, Chiang Mai, Thailand. And today, I will sharing my experiences on how to submit a research manuscript to a scientific journal. So this is the outline of my talk today. Firstly, I will begin my talk with how to finalize a research manuscript. 
and then talk about how to prepare a research manuscript for submission to a scientific journal and end up my talk with uh, what will be happen after submitting a research manuscript to a scientific journal. The first section is talk about how to finalizing a research manuscript. To finalize your research manuscript, first of all, you should ask your colleagues, researcher in the network, professor, or even your mentor to review your draft of the research manuscript in order to verify the contents, emphasize the significance of the research, and to ensure the relevance of the content and the topic. And also to help you editing your grammar, spelling errors, typos, clarity, and conciseness of the research manuscript. You should know that a good manuscript is a manuscript that is clearly written, easy to follow, and appropriate for the intended audience. So for this step, you may want to have about two to three people help you reviewing your manuscript. And at least one of your reviewers should be non-expert in the major topic in order to get the outside perspective. For the next step, you should revise your manuscript based on their suggestion. Once you get the comments and feedbacks from your colleagues, you should begin revising the draft accordingly in order to make the manuscript clear, engaging, and easy to follow. Please note that you may have to go through several drafts of your research manuscript before getting the final version of the research manuscript. So do not rush submitting your article for publication. For the next step, you should find out the journal that could be best suited for publishing your research manuscript because each journal has its own audience and tone of writing. But please always prioritize peer reviewed journals. Here are the examples of a specific journal. So if you have the research manuscript that is related to HV and AIDS topic, you may would like to submit your research manuscript to this journal. For example, if your research manuscript is focused on health economics or health policy or operational research or implementation science, you may would like to submit your research manuscript to the JIAS. And if your manuscript is focused on original scientific research or clinical science, it should be another good choice for your research manuscript. For example, if your research manuscript is related to trans translational research or implementation science, JS is another good choice. Or if your research manuscript focusing on pharmacological science, preclinical studies, or in vitro study, HIV medicine may be a good home for your research manuscript as well. But if your research manuscript is related to mental health aspect of HIV AIDS or medical and behavioral consequences of HIV infection is and behavior may be another good home for your research manuscript. And for example, if your research manuscript is related to planning of HIV services or social and psychological aspect of HIV care and treatment is care may be a good choice for your research manuscript as well. But please note that if you would like to submit your research manuscript to a specific journal, your target audience will be HIV experts and also healthcare professionals who are interested in HIV and AIDS topic. But if your research manuscript is not related to HIV and AIDS, but related to just infectious disease, these are examples of infectious disease non-AIDS journal. For example, clinical infectious disease or the periodic infectious disease journal. And please note that your target audience for these kinds of journal will be ID specialists or general practitioners. The next step, you should prepare your manuscript according to your chosen journal's requirement. You should format your research manuscript to fit the guidelines for that publication. So please refer to a document called Instruction to Authors or Other Guides Like This that offers a specific instructions about the layout, the type font, and the length of the manuscript. And this document will guide you about how to submit your research manuscript as well as provide the details about the review process. Next, I will talk about how to prepare a research manuscript for submission to a scientific journal. The first step, you should carefully read through the instruction for orders and prepare the manuscript according to the guidelines based on the chosen article category. You should know that the manuscript that do not follow the instruction may be returned to you for the corrections. 
Next, you should check your manuscript categories and its requirement because each journal has the manuscript categories and article types specifically. And once you know your manuscript categories, you should read through the instruction for order to know the uh, category requirement and format. You should check the format of the abstract, the main text, the number of tables and figures, as well as the number of references and the allowance of the, the additional files and supplemental materials. Please note that some journals have an example template to download for you for use as an example. Next, you should prepare the submission package, which include the cover letter, the main text file, which include title page, keywords, abstract, main text, conflict of interest statement, authorship, acknowledgments, and also references, together with table and or figure file, if any. So once you feel that your manuscript is satisfied and ready to go, you should submit your research manuscript to the journal. So with this step, you should go to online submission portal and begin the submission process. Follow the instruction of your submission step by step. And please note that you should submit your research article to only one journal at a time. Next, I will talk about what will be happen after submit a research manuscript to a scientific journal. The first step, you should track your submitted paper. After you submit a research manuscript to a scientific journal, you can track the status of your submitted paper online through the online submission system. And you should know that the initial review takes around two months to get the initial feedback. Next, you should calmly waiting for the journal initial response. Please be patient and be prepared to hear no a lot. And the journal in the initial response will likely to be one of the following, such as accept with revision, revise and resubmit, reject and resubmit, and reject. You should know that very few article submissions get an immediate accept reply from the peer review journal at the first time. Next, please address all reviewer comments carefully. If you are asked to revise your paper and resubmit it again, you should embrace reviewer comments as constructive criticism. You should study their critiques very carefully and make the necessary changes. And please note that you do not have to follow all reviewer comments if you feel are off the mark, but should open a dialogue or discussion with the editor and explain your position respectfully and confidently. Please do not go overwrite the original submission, but please use the track chains or highlights to keep the track of all revisions. And finally, please keep trying to get your paper published. If you are ultimately rejected by your preferred journal, continue to rewrite your research paper and submit it to other publications. Please know that a rejected paper doesn't mean that it is a bad paper because several factors go into determining uh, which articles are accepted for each journal. So please keep moving on to your second choice journal for submission to find the best home for your research manuscript. Finally, good luck with your submission. Thank you. Thank you for joining my presentation. And I know that Dr. Mayer are prepared to address some frequently asked questions about the manuscript preparation and submission. And I'm looking forward to hear your uh, response. Dr. Mayer, please. I'm now going to answer some questions that have been submitted to us. Um, the first question is, how do I select a journal that matches my manuscript? Uh, this is something that uh, people develop the skill over time. The more journals you read and the more papers that you see in these journals, uh, this allows you to have an idea of what each journal um, um, publishes, what kinds of papers they like. Um, the objective way to do this is certainly looking at the web page of the journal of a number of journals and seeing uh, what kinds of papers they particularly like. But reading specific issues of the journal will give you a sense of what do the papers look like. And then you can, in your mind, decide, is, does my paper look more like this uh, paper that goes in this journal or that journal? Um, 
it's not an exact science. It's something that the more you do it, the easier it will be to sort of figure out what is the best match. Um, sometimes journals will have a call for special papers, and that's another opportunity to figure out a good match. Uh, so um, you may uh, be doing a, a study and not have thought of a specific journal, but then you'll um, hear about a solicitation that they want to have a special issue, and that may be a good fit as well. The next question is, what are the differences between open access journals and paid journals? Um, there's a whole spectrum of different types of journals now. Um, many of the open access journals um, also uh, charge um, individuals. It really gets to the question of whether the uh, author who submits the paper has to pay a publication fee, in which case the journal is free to everyone, or whether um, there are paid subscriptions for the journal. Um, this is a complicated situation because uh, some of the journals that charge for subscriptions um, have special programs for people from uh, resource limited countries and certainly will also have subscriptions for institutions. So if you are a um, researcher in a teaching hospital or in a um, um, academic medical center uh, university, very often uh, those institutions will have paid subscriptions to a journal and then um, the um, cost of the journal will be essentially free by going through uh, the electronic library of that institution. Um, so for you as an author, uh, the big consideration should be, do you have the funding to um, pay to have your um, work published in a journal that would uh, be open access and people could easily access for free. Um, and in which case you may have more opportunities. Um, but it also may be that um, there may be specific journals that because of their audience, because of the content in that journal, you particularly want to publish in that journal. That would be an important consideration as well. Um, the next question is, as there are many people helping me to conduct the research, who should I list as a co-author? And who should I listen to acknowledgement? This is a very important question. Um, and the answer is not always as clear cut as we'd like. Um, clearly, individuals who have helped design the research, um, who help um, analyze the data, who help write up the manuscript or provide um, information that is part of the manuscript, such as the literature review, these are definitely individuals who are co-authors. At the other extreme, if there is a research assistant or a study nurse who basically is given the protocol, follows the protocol, doesn't do anything differently, is supervised by one of the co-authors, does an excellent job in following participants, in collecting data uh, using a form that already has been established, those individuals are people who should definitely be acknowledged. They did contribute to the study but they didn't contribute independently uh, intellectually, and therefore they would not be considered co-authors. What you want to avoid are honorary co-authors, um, you know, a department chair who um, hasn't read the manuscript, who hasn't done anything. Um, they can be acknowledged. If, you know, it may be that you wouldn't be able to have done the work if you were not part of that department, and, that, and that's um, worth acknowledging, but certainly if they're not contributing intellectually. So, the real question you want to ask yourself is, did this person help me think of the idea of the study? So if, and if you spent uh, hours and hours talking to the department chair about uh, what the conceptualization of the study was, they um, gave ideas based on their experience. They helped you secure the funds to conduct the research. Um, they helped you identify the participants. Uh, that department chair certainly should be a co-author. But if they just sat in their office and when you finished the research, you said, well, uh, we finished our project and they said, oh, that's great, make me a co-author. That's somebody who preferably would be in the acknowledgements. The next question, as English is not my first language, do I need to send my manuscript to professional proofreader um, or uh, editing service before submitting the manuscript? This is a tough question. Um, um, we know that 
not everybody has access to uh, these kinds of resources. But unfortunately, the journals um, um, do not have the budget to be doing um, all the uh, proof editing themselves. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, it can make a very bad impression if the paper is written in a way that is hard to follow because the English is not good. Um, so preferably, one should find a way, whether it's a member of the study team or res re um, resorting to one of these services may be necessary. Um, uh, because I think if the English is reasonably polished when the paper is submitted, that will be a plus. Uh, certainly, if there are a few small um, errors in usage, uh, editors will not um, hold that against uh, um, an author and will be happy to edit. So it's really, again, a question of degree. But if, if there are lots of problems with um, uh, syntax, uh, certainly somebody needs to be doing editing before the paper is submitted. What process will my manuscript go through upon submission and how long will all the processes take? Um, this is a great question and um, very hard to answer because each journal has its own process. So um, what I showed in uh, the slide uh, in my talk was sort of a schema of what happens in general. But you know, some journals will um, have uh, various steps where they do an automatic triage. Um, sometimes uh, the triage will be only with the um, editors in chief. Sometimes there'll be other members of the editorial board that will go through papers and they may make a quick decision to reject or um, uh, send for further review. Uh, the review process is not um, always easy to anticipate because um, if a paper uh, um, undergoes a review where the reviewers strongly disagree, sometimes editors will want to get a, yet another opinion which can delay uh, the process. Um, once uh, the paper is sent back to the authors with the comments of the reviewer, if there's a request for uh, revise and resubmit, uh, then it's how, how long does the author take uh, to revise the paper. And sometimes the revisions require new work, uh, uh, new analyses, and that can take time. Sometimes the authors are busy, that can take time as well, but sometimes um, it will be a fairly quick and smooth process. Um, it's very rare for a paper to um, be submitted, undergo review, um, and to be accepted and published within a month. Uh, we're talking, you know, a few months, uh, and many journals try to do this process uh, within three or four months, but certainly um, six months is certainly not uncommon uh, to go from initial submission to actual uh, publication, uh, though all of us try to do this as, as expeditiously as possible, but there are so many steps and uh, we're not in control necessarily of how quickly the reviewers get back to us as well. And, and as I mentioned, if the reviewers disagree uh, and one reviewer thinks the paper is really great and a few others think it's terrible, trying to rectify that can take time. Next question, when my manuscript is submitted to the journal, how do I track it for for its status? Um, important question. Uh, many journals, but not all, will have a, a, a function where um, when, you, uh, when you submit uh, to the editorial uh, page, uh, there will be a, an acknowledgement and there'll be a, um, a tracking system where you can log in and um, it will um, say a manuscript under review or a manuscript sent for review. Um, but some journals are more explicit about uh, where those stages uh, and it will give more specific information. And others um, just will acknowledge that the paper was submitted and is under review. Um, it, it's not uh, necessarily that easy to know exactly when you'll get the information back. So um, we just urge people to um, submit and then stay put. Uh, and uh, certainly if, um, several months have gone by and there's no communication, uh, writing to the editorial office is not unreasonable, but certainly um, within weeks, uh, that would not be reasonable, but certainly two or three months, one could certainly inquire what's happening with the paper. And the last question, when I get the comments from the reviewers, how should I respond to their comments to get the manuscript accepted? Um, the best thing to do 
is to cut and paste uh, the reviewer's comments onto a Word document and then to respond point by point. Uh, nothing uh, antagonizes an editor um, if um, the um, author uh, decides to eliminate some of the reviews that they don't want to respond to uh, and others selectively responding uh, to review. Um, it's very important to go point by point and um, use a different either font or um, bold uh, the responses to the questions so uh, the um, reviewers and the editors can easily follow what you're responding to and how you're responding and do it in the order that uh, you receive uh, the comments uh, from the journal. Uh, an important point to know is that uh, you do not have to agree with everything that the reviewer says and you don't have to do everything but you do have to respond and you should explain why you disagree or why something cannot be done. So sometimes a reviewer uh, may have all the best intent in the world and say, well, I think uh, uh, the participants need to be recontacted uh, re for the following questions. And you can um, respond uh, to that comment. Uh, I'm sorry, but the study is over and the informed consent doesn't allow for further contact. You know, so uh, sometimes things that they request and you don't want to do or can't do um, will be very easily uh, addressed and you can respond and the editors will be quite satisfied with that response. So it's just important to respond and to be respectful. If, if, if you really think the reviewer said something stupid, um, don't respond back, uh, this is really stupid, but you certainly can say, um, you know, I respectfully disagree and this is the reason why. So as long as you take the review comments seriously, uh, the editors and the reviewers will um, generally appreciate it. And it's that kind of patient persistence that will get a paper accepted. So I want to thank you for your participation in this um, virtual session. So finally, I would like to thank Professor Kenneth Mayer for accept our invitation to joining this capacity building session. And thank everyone for the audience for joining this session together with me and Professor Kenneth Mayer today. And I hope that uh, this session will be very helpful for you to prepare your manuscript and submit your research manuscript to a scientific journal. And please enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you so much.